Let's pick up now in uh, chapter 16. Here's the most notable thing in chapter 16. And that is, in the beginning, as the captivity approached, Jeremiah was commanded that he could not have a family. He's forbidden to marry or to have a family. It says, you shall not take a wife, in verse 2, for yourself or have daughters or sons in this place. So I would mark next to that 1 Corinthians 7 when Paul recommended that within, with the oncoming of persecution, sometimes it's wise not to have any kind of family. And we pointed that out earlier, but one of the things he says is he's going to give them counsel on how to deal with people in the, um, in the future, but at the beginning, his present is pretty tough. I want you to notice the first half of it has to do with the current day that he's in, but verses 14 to 21 deal specifically with the, another return. It says, verse 14, Therefore, behold, days are coming, and I'd underline days are coming, when it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but this is what we will say. As the Lord lives who brought the sons of Israel from the land of the north and from all the countries where he had banished them. In other words, I'm about to move forward with restoration. Up till now, you've always talked about the God who brought you out of Egypt. I'm going to be the God who brought you out of captivity in all these other lands and brought you back to the land of new restoration. And he says, I'm going to declare, uh, I'm going to send for many fishermen, declares the Lord, and they will fish for them. This is the I will make you fishers of men passage of Jeremiah. Uh, he says, I will, I will fish for them, and afterwards I will send for many hunters, and I will hunt from them from every mountain, every hill, from the clefts of the rocks. There's two sides to this. On the one hand, it's like God will regather the Jewish people. On another hand, Many times, if you look at history, the Jewish people were largely gathered by people who wanted to do them harm. They came back to Israel to get away from other people. Um, so there's a lot of ways to read that. Verse 17, my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is iniquity concealed from my eyes. This is God speaking into, I know who you are. I see where you live. I'm watching you all the time. And he says, I will doubly repay iniquity and their sin because they have polluted my land. They have filled my inheritance with carcasses and detestable idols. And then Jer Jeremiah begins to pray. And this is one of those um, prayers with this. Well, well listen to the way he, he phrases. Oh, Lord, my strength and my stronghold, my refuge in the day of distress, to you the nations will come. Do you see the millennial promise? Uh, from the ends of the earth, they will say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but falsehood, futility, and things of no profit. Down in verse 21, Therefore, behold, I'm going to make them know this time, I will make them know my power, my might. They will know that my name is the Lord. God's great promise in the future, as Jeremiah lays it out, is that he's going to come in that millennial reign, and people are going to come from all over the world and, and engage him. Here, he, you know, there's many opportunities to look at this in different ways, but I think that that's at least at the, a, a part of it. Go to 17. 1 to 4, I want you to see two words that you underline. In verse 1, the word sin, and in the middle of verse 1, engraved. Your sin is engraved. I see the indelible engraving of your sin. Verses 5 through 8, Underline just in verse 5, cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. I don't want you to trust people they can't deliver you. Down in verse 7, underline blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. So there's a contrast. There are people who will trust what God says and many people who will trust what man says. Here is God's warning. It's in verse, verses 9 and the first half of 10. I would put a box around it. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? That's the question. What's the answer? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. God alone knows what's real in the hearts and minds of people. Can I just suggest to you that you may not even be conscious or aware of what's real in your own mind? I, I'm, you know, all of us have this experience where we tell a story about our childhood so many times, but that's not actually how it happened. That's how we remember it. 
Then your sister says, that's not what happened. That's the way I remember it. But yeah, but that's not what happened. Um, we, we are, our heart doesn't give automatic recall of events. It gives interpretations of those events that tend to make us look good and the other person not look so good. Now take a look at the, um, the proverb found in verse 11. As a partridge that hatches eggs, which, is not, which it has not laid, so is he who makes a fortune but unjustly. In the midst of his days, it will forsake him. In the end, he will be a fool. What's he trying to say? What's the proverb mean? Again, it's flowery, flowery proverbial metaphor. He says, here's this bird that didn't lay this egg, but it sits on top of the egg and hatches it. Okay. And he says, in that same way, a person who makes a fortune on the backs of other people are hatching what was not his own. In the end, he'll be a fool. Why? What happens to the bird who's sitting on the little hatchlings when the hatchlings come out? Yeah, they get pushed off and it becomes apparent that they've been sitting on the wrong egg. The point of the proverb is you're trusting the wrong thing. You're sitting on the wrong egg. We even call our finances a nest egg. You're sitting on the wrong egg. You're, you're going to be stabilized by something, and in the end, you will be a fool. You'll be disconnected from where the real uh, stability comes from. From verse 12 through verse 18, he tells a story of uh, how God is going to have his throne set back in its place in the sanctuary where it belongs. And he calls on God to heal him in verse 14 and save him and, and um, to be his trust, his strength, so that he's not going through trouble by himself. There's almost a very personal sense to this. And then when you get down to verses 19 to 27, he turns his attention to one subject. Thus the Lord said to me, go and stand in the public gate through which the kings of Judah come in and go out as well in all the gates of Jerusalem, and say to them, Listen to the word of the Lord, kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem who come in through these gates. Thus says the Lord, Take heed for yourself. Do not carry any load on the Sabbath or bring anything in through the gates of Jerusalem. I want you to notice that in verse 22, this will be a constant problem. We're going to see this again at the end of Ezra where you see them, again, making their way in and out and violating the Sabbath. You shall not bring a load out of your houses on Sabbath, nor do any work, but keep the Sabbath day holy. Why is that so hard for people at the time of Jeremiah when it's obvious that's been the law of God since all the way back at the time of Moses? Why are they stumbling over Sabbath? Why? What would be the motivator what stops people from cordoning off time that God has told them to give to him? If you work more hours, you get more money. That's it. The point is, what happens is, people will start explaining to you how they need to do this work because they can't cover their needs unless they ignore God. Now stop and think about what I just said, and you'll see the error of it. I'm not trying to tell you that you have to quit your job if they ever want you to work on Sunday. But what about every Sunday? What about every opportunity you have to get together with the people of God, they shut down? I'm not kidding. I knew a person who in every, if they had a Tuesday night Bible study, their boss would ask them to work Tuesday night. Now, the boss wasn't aware of it, but they're not competing against flesh and blood. And I watched them. You know what happens to a hot coal when you move it to the outside of the fire? It turns gray and ashen. You got to put it back in the fire to get it red again. You need each other. We all need each other. We've got to be in this together. We're not called to do it alone. What happens is people go out and they get busy and they realize the land isn't producing and they're not getting as much. So maybe if they add some extra hours, but wait a minute, who controls what the land produces? This is why Americans would rather protest and lift placards at a political event than pray. Because they don't get it. They honestly believe it's presidents that make policies. And what they don't understand is that there's a king above all kings. You're, you're on the wrong page. 
I'm not telling you you can't protest. I'm saying don't protest without prayer or it's meaningless. If you don't do the first thing, don't do the second. So ultimately the end of this ends up now. There's a picture, another one of those pictures. We had a picture a couple of chapters ago with a belt. This is a picture in chapter 18 of, um, it says, Arise, get down to the potter's house, and I will announce my words to you. I want you to go to the pottery shop. Stand there, and I'm going to tell you what to say. So I went. Verse 3, he was making something on the wheel, but the vessel that he was making on the clay, uh, of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. That's when the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you like the potter does? In other words, can't I just squish you and make you again? Because that's what he did. He said, I, he said, he says, at that, at one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, to destroy it. If that nation again, against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity. He said, I, I'm perfectly open to having you come back to me, but that's not what you're doing. Here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to fire the pottery without remaking it while it's broke. I'm not going to do that. He goes down to verse 13 and he asks a question. Who ever heard of anything like this? The Virgin of Israel has done a most appalling thing. Does the snow of Lebanon forsake the rock of the open country? Here's what he's saying. Nature's reliable. You can count on snow to stick to a rock. How about the cold flowing water from a foreign land? Is it ever snatched away? You can count on water going downhill. You really can. It, when I make something, it's supposed to do something, but my people have forgotten me. You guys are utterly unreliable. I can trust nothing about what you, what you have become. And that's the picture in the poorly made pot in 18, in 19. This is um, pot number two, the sequel. The exciting conclusion of the first movie as we look at another pot. Okay, maybe not that exciting. Verse 1. This time he says, Go and buy a potter's earthen jar, earthenware jar. Take some of the elders of the people and take some of the senior priests. Then go out to the valley of Ben-Hinnom, ben that's the valley just outside Jaffa Gate, which is the entrance of the, potter, uh, the, the, uh, the potsherd gate. And proclaim there the words that I tell you. Okay, so he says, listen, go get a piece of pottery and get all these guys together. Walk them out to the edge of this gate, and then I'm going to tell you what to say. Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Behold, I'm about to bring a calamity upon this place. Verse 4, because they've forsaken me and have made this an alien place and have burned sacrifices in it to other gods. I want you to see something. The place that he's looking at is the Hinnom Valley. And in Jeremiah 32, the Hinnom Valley is a place where the high places of Tophet were. That means nothing to you. But it's a place where they burn children. This was a place where child sacrifice and child burning occurred. The Hinnom Valley in the Old Testament is called Gai, means V-shaped valley, Gai Hinnom. Gai Hinnom in the New Testament is Gehenna. It's the place of the burning of the trash where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. It's the imagery for hell in Luke's gospel. Why? Well, what happened was people were put, it, put up high places to Tophet, burn their babies, and the price of the real estate plummeted. And, and, and I'm not trying to be snide about it. I'm just saying that what happened is by that time it ended up being a trash dump and, and the places of the former representations of those gods became a place of burial and a place of burning trash that was always going. The imagery of hell indirectly came from this place. This says, I am going to take it out on you. It says, look, verse 5. They have built high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire. There it is. Verse 7 says, I'll make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem. So the major charge in, in chapter 19 is that the, the broken potter's vessel was seen in that they no longer even cared for their children. They were willing to sacrifice their children on, false, on the altars of false gods. I am watching it happen in my own nation now where people will stand up and they will tell you it is my unmitigated right to kill a child that was inconveniently conceived. Now, when you get down to, to chapter 20, another person is introduced into the text. His name is Pashur and he's a false speaker. He, uh, he's a priest. He's a chief officer in the house of the Lord. He's a big wig. 
and verse 2 says that he had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put him in stocks in the upper, uh, at the upper Benjamin gate. And then later on, the next day, he released Jeremiah, and you would have thought Jeremiah settled down. He didn't. Jeremiah says in verse 3, Pashur is not the name of the Lord has called you, but rather Magor Misaviv. Magor Misaviv means terror on every side. And he's not talking about the fact that he beat him. It says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am going to, to make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends while your eyes look on, and they will fall by the sword of their enemies. So I will give over all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. He will carry them away as exiles to Babylon, and he will slay them with the sword. He said, You know what? You can beat on me if you want, but I know where you're going. I know what's about to happen to you, and you can be as snotty as you want because you are going to watch your friends be butchered in front of you. And he ends with, Pashur, all, verse 6, who live in your house will go into captivity. You're, you're done. Now, what's interesting is it's followed in verses 7 to 18, the rest of the chapter, with a, an incredible, deep, moaning, woe is me. This is depressed Jeremiah, okay? We tune in now to find the weeping prophet sitting depressed. This is what he says. Lord, you deceive me. And I was deceived. You've overcome me and prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everybody mocks me. And here's what you're going to read. Me, 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 me. It's so sad. And the end of the chapter is to say, get a clue, big guy. But you know what I love? I love that God included his moaning. You know why? Because I've done this and so have you. There is a message in 21, and the message <coughs> is his message for Zedekiah. Zedekiah remembers the one who will watch his children be executed and have his eyeballs put out. So his ending spot isn't real good. Um, before that happened, while he still could see and while he still had children, the word of the Lord came to, to Jeremiah from the, from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent him to Pashur, the son of Malchiah, and to uh, Zephaniah, Zephan the priest, the son of Maaseah, saying, Please inquire of the Lord on our behalf, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is warring against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful acts so that the enemy will withdraw from us. <laughs> These are the foxhole believers. They're the ones who, they didn't have any time for God until now they're surrounded and then they go, God, I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you my soul. I'm going to sing songs. I'm going to learn the guitar. I'm going to do it all. And... Jeremiah said, uh, Jeremiah said to them, You shall say to Zedekiah the following thing. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I'm about to turn back the weapons of war which are in your hands, with which you are warring against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans who are besieging you outside their wall. I will gather them into the center of the city. I myself will war against you, and even with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm, even in anger and wrath and great indignation. In other words, you're cooked. Stick a th thermometer in it, you're already done. Um, he says in no uncertain terms in verse 7, I will give over Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants and the people, even those who survive in this city, from the pestilence, sword, famine, and the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hand of their foes, into the hand of those who seek their lives, and will strike them down with the edge of the sword. In other words, it's over. You will lose. You need to plan on captivity, Zedekiah, because it's over. God did, doesn't always send friendly, happy messages. Sometimes what he says is, it's over. I keep running into people who, when God says that they need to know Jesus while they're alive or they will be lost in a Christless eternity, somehow they have in their mind that they're only somewhat lost and somehow they'll get another chance. That is not a God thing. It sounds like a God thing. It sounds compassionate. It sounds loving. It's a lie. The last thing you want to do is tell somebody they have more time than they really have. That is not loving. It's terrible. And so 21 just lays it out. And he says at the end of 21, Behold, I am against you, verse 13, O valley dweller, O rock, rocky plain, declares the Lord. You men who say, Who will come down against us? Who will enter into our habitations? I will punish you according to the results of your deeds. It's interesting. 
he, God lays it out and he says, it's over. Now, I'm pushing fast because I want to get us to a certain point by lunch, but just look very closely at 22 in the beginning. The Lord says, go down to the house of the king of Judah and there speak this word. Hear the word of the Lord, verse 2, king of Judah, who sits on David's throne. Verse 3, do justice, do righteousness. Deliver the one who has been robbed from the power of his oppressor. Do not mistreat or do violence to the stranger, orphan, and widow. So first, stop oppressing people and allowing people to be oppressed. Second, look at the weak people in your society. Stand up for them. Third, do not shed innocent blood in this place. These are the things that the Lord hates. The inequity, the injustice, the shedding of blood. And verse 4 says, If you men will indeed perform this thing, then kings will enter the gates of the house, sitting in David's place. All I'm asking you to do is soften your heart to my word and execute exactly what I'm telling you to do, and you'll have a king sitting on the throne. But verse 5, if you will not obey these words, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, which is, by the way, the highest thing you can swear against, that this house will become a desolation. And then, he's, then he stops. He says, this is what the Lord says concerning you, kings of Judah. You are abundant. You're like Gilead to me. That's the word of, for an abundance. You, you like the summit of Lebanon, you most assuredly, I will make you like a wilderness. So you have been abundant, and I'm going to make you desolate. He says, um, I will set apart destroyers against you, with, with, with each with his weapons, and they will cut down your choicest cedars. So I'm going to strip you of your ability to stand up and fight. Many nations, verse 8, will pass by the city and they'll say, what has the Lord done to this great city? Then they will answer because they forsook their covenant. There's something I want you to know about this. Jeremiah says to Jerusalem that people are going to come and look at Jerusalem and go, what happened to these people? But later on in 17 and 18 of Revelation, and I have marked Revelation 17 and 18, this is going to turn over. When God's people are on the ropes, God is going to bring down the world system of Babylon in an hour, and people are going to look back at it and say, what happened that mighty Babylon fell? It's the reverse of this. So this one is all about my people. When you don't stand up and do right, the world will look at you and go, what happened to them? In Revelation 17 and 18, when the world system is under attack and God takes it down, then all the world will look at it and say, look what happened to us. It's all fallen apart. And the people that know God will look at them and see what God has done to them. It's the reverse. As we close off to go to lunch, I just want you to look at the second half of 22. That's as far as I need to get. And that'll put us right on track to where we need to be five minutes from now. Okay? Watch this. In verse 10, it says, Do not weep for the dead or mourn for him, but weep continually for those who, go, uh, uh, who goes away, for he, he never returns or will see his native land. I'm going to take away the capti captives. I want you to weep not for the dead, but for those who go away and lose their home. And then he says, Thus says the Lord in regard to Shalom. By the way, you know who Je Shalom is Jehoahaz? And... Um, it says, the son of Josiah, king of, of, of Judah, who, who became king in the place of Josiah after his father was killed by Necho. And it says, he went forth and he will never return there. You remember that after Josiah, there's another removal. The removal of Jehoahaz or Shalom is a removal that there's actually 606, then 597, then 586. The middle one happens as a result of this. So he says... Uh, I'm, just tell them he's not coming back. And in verse 12, be, but in the place where they led him captive, there he will die and not see his land again. So God gives a word, Jehoahaz, you've been taken captive, you're going away, you're never coming back. Why? What were the enumerated sins of Judah that got God upset? In verse 13, woe to him who builds his house without righteousness and his upper rooms without justice. Luxury built on the backs of other people. Inequitable luxury. Who uses his neighbor's service, uh, services without pay. He cheats people. 
uh, who does not give him his wages, who says, I will build myself a roomy house, house with spacious upper rooms and cut out its windows, paneling it with cedar and painting in uh, bright red, extravagance. So here it is, cheating to gain extravagance. And he goes, do not become a king because you are competing in, ce uh, competing in cedar. But did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? And it was well with him. He says, did you not see, Yehoahaz, that jo Josiah did right and God blessed him? People are going to look at the blessing of believers and try to imitate it through trickery. And he says, I'm going to use that against you. The rest of this passage is about God looking down on kings like Jehoiakim or Jehoiakim in verse 18 and saying, there's no respect there. They don't long to respect. You've forgotten me. All these things that they have done wrong. Now, that brings you to a big messianic passage. And chapter 22 ends with this kind of downbeat that Jehoiakim, I, I, I have had such judgment against your people. But verse 24 says, as I live, declares the Lord, even though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim uh, of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, yet I will pull you off. You're not going to be blessed, and, but there is a future blessing for the people. Chapter 23, verses 1 through 8 is the great solution of the coming of Messiah. Chapter 23 is a messianic passage, and there are not, it's, this is not like Isaiah, where you have many, many messianic passages. There are some allusions, but this one's a very, uh, chapter 23, verses 1 through 8, sets up the true prophet, the true shepherd, the true branch, the one that will come as Messiah, and then he picks up uh, basically fa false prophets and pushes forward through much of the rest of the chapter with the false. In chapter 23, he opens with, woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. He says in verse 3, I myself, notice that myself is capitalized because the, the uh, translator knows that he's speaking in first person. I myself will gather the remnant of the flock out of all the countries. So there's a regathering. And then it says, I will also raise up shepherds over them and they will tend them. But then down below, it talks about one shepherd in verse 5. Behold, the days are coming. And often he says that about end time events. And he says, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called Yahweh Nisi or the Lord our righteousness. And here's the thing. Um, when you look at the passage, he says... I'm going to do this personally. I'm going to do this at the end times. I'm going to do this as king. I'm going to do this in stability. That can't be the first coming of Jesus. That's not what he did. He did not come and make reign as king and have that set up with that kind of stability. Here's what, what I do know. He, he promised to do that in the future. And when he promised to do it in the future, he... He said he would set up an abundant kingdom. I would probably say uh, somewhere like Ezekiel 34 and some of those blessings that go with it would, would fit into here next to verse 5. Um, I would say that Ezekiel 37 and the reuniting of the northern and southern tribes together uh, goes along with that. All of this, and then go down to verse 8. And it says, as the Lord lives who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land and from the, all the countries where I, where I had driven them, then they will live on their own soil. So it's clear that there's an ingathering that the land is very much a part of this. This isn't just, well, spiritually they'll come back and spiritually there'll be a revival, but the, that the Jewish people will be in their land and that the, the, the descendants of the household of Israel will return. You could make that the earlier coming, but it doesn't fit what it says about him reigning as king. That has not happened. So those days still look like they're forward. I would make those millennial statements. 
much of the rest of the passage is uh, basically that the priests and prophets of Judah were wicked and that divine uh, vengeance was hanging over top of them and that the people, th they shouldn't listen to false promises, that they should face the ruin and understand it's going to happen. There is a, there is profit to understanding that judgment was coming down on them. And so basically when you get to all, starting in verse 9, all the way to verse 40, he he um, levels against them. Don't believe the message of those who say we won't be judged. If I had anything to put uh, but besides, beside the second half of chapter 23, don't believe the false message of deliverance. We will face deportation. And then you get to a picture in chapter 24. And this is a picture that is going to be a little bit strange. It's a picture of your... It's better if you go to Babylon. It's better if you go to Babylon. Here's why I say that. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, son of Jehoiachim, uh, king of uh, Judah, and the officials of Judah with the craftsmen and smiths from Jerusalem had brought them to Babylon. The Lord showed me, behold, two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Lord. One basket had very good figs, like first ripe figs. The other basket had very bad figs, like they could not be eaten due to rottenness. Then the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? I said, figs. Good figs, very good, and bad figs, very bad, which cannot be eaten due to rottenness. The Lord said to me, thus says the Lord God of Israel, like these good figs, so I will regard as good the captives of Judah, whom I sent out of this place into the land of Chal uh, the Chaldeans. So the ones going out were the good figs. I will give them a heart to know me for I am the Lord and they will be my people and I will be their God for they will return to me with their whole heart. The promise is I'm going to take them out but sometime later regather them and I'm going to restore their heart. You're going to see more about this in Jeremiah 31, but the important thing to see here is it, the good ones are not the ones you would think are good. They're being deported, but there's some good things going to come out of the deportation that are hard to understand. Can anybody tell me some good things that came from the Babylonian deportation? Daniel himself was a blessing, but also look at what he was. What's the first six chapters about? Shining a light in dark place. They brought blessing to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar learned the meaning of dreams because of Daniel. Good things happened because they went into captivity. And in fact, one of the biggest blessings of the captivity, and I'd put it next to there, is Ezekiel's message that the temple wasn't what they thought it was. That God said, you see a temple. I see bugs and nastiness in the spiritual world crawling all over that place. You see it as something that's, wow, this is the temple of Solomon. No, it's a building and it looks cool. But I got to tell you, there's a lot of nasty stuff going on there. So sort of the underbelly was exposed by Ezekiel. And that's going to be one of the important features of Ezekiel. So that comes out of the uh, captivity. He says, the bad figs, verse 8, which cannot be eaten due to rottenness, indeed, thus says the Lord, I will abandon Zedekiah, king of, of Judah, and his officials, and the remnant of Jerusalem, who will remain in this land, and the ones who dwell in the land of Egypt. And he will be one of those who dwell in the land of Egypt, because Jeremiah will be whisked away to Egypt. It says, I will make them a terror and an evil for all the kingdoms of the earth. Reproach, a taunt, a curse. In other words, if they stay here, they're leaving, the, they're, they're, they're possessing the temple, but when they go away, they will be such a, a rottenness about them that everybody's going to go, look at what happened to those guys. Better to get out now and be taken away and experience some of the blessing of encountering Ezekiel and Daniel than to stay there and have the rottenness played out over time. That's where he's going. Now, we're in a section of the book here where all of this is sort of the captivity channel. I mean, he's talking about here, chapter 24, here's the remarkable statement. Captivity is good for you. 
Who, who would think that? Well, he's trying to give them a little bit of a silver lining of how it's good. And, and honestly, in chapter 25, word comes to Jeremiah that in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, that uh, because Judah has not hearkened to the prophet, it will be captive for a specific period of time. Here's what's important. Put a box around 2511. And then make a note next to it with big stars, 70 years. The whole land of, will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon, how long? 70 years. Why is that passage so significant? You're going to come back to Daniel, and he's going to go, I was reading in Jeremiah that it was supposed to be 70 years long. The reason that Jeremiah, uh, the reason that Daniel in Daniel 9 knew that God wanted to move them back in 70 years was he said, he says in Daniel 9 in the beginning of the chapter, I was reading in Jeremiah and that's how I knew. So there's a continuity of biblical thought from this verse over into the book of Daniel. And, and one of the most important things is that after 70 years, the king of ba Babylon would himself be punished and all the nations would become uh, judged by God. And it's interesting, go all the way down to 25, verse 30. God says to Jeremiah, Therefore you shall prophesy against them all these words, and you shall say to them, The Lord will roar from on high and utter his voice from the holy habitation. He will roar mightily against his fold. He will shout like those who tread the graves against the inhabitants of the earth. A clamor has come to the end of the earth because the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He's entering into judgment with all flesh. As for the wicked, he has given them to the sword, declares the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil is going forth from nation to nation. A great storm is being stirred up from the remotest parts of the earth. God is promising that there's going to be a vast, powerful, international tribulation in the future. And then it says, Those slain by the Lord on that day will be from one end of the earth to the other. They will not be lamented, gathered, or buried. They will be like dung on the face of the ground. You know, Revelation 16 talks about um, the, the ga gathering 1616 16 in the valley of Megiddo and in chapter 19 it describes this event where the bodies are strewn across the ground and the birds pick over them that's Revelation 19 the first 10 verses so when you're looking at the passage it says a wail you shepherds verse 34 and cry wallow in ashes you masters of the flock you will fall like a choice vessel. And he goes on and he describes how negative that whole tribulation scene will be. All right, pick up 26. Unless you have questions, I'm going to keep, keep flying for the goal here. In 26, word comes to Jeremiah in the beginning of the uh, reign of Jehoiakim or Jehoiakim. Uh, Jeremiah makes a call for repentance in the court of the temple. He outlines it. And it says, stand in the court, verse 2, of the Lord's house, speak to the cities of Judah who have come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I have commanded you to speak, do not omit a word. He says, I want you to tell them exactly what I told you to tell them. And he goes on in verse 3, maybe they'll listen. Verse 4, you will say to them, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me, and walk in my law, which I have set before you, to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have been sending to you again and again, but you have not listened. Then I will make this house like Shiloh. I will strip where the tabernacle was in Shiloh. I'll strip the temple in Jerusalem. It's going to look like a ruin, just like the tabernacle looks like a ruin. Right in the middle of the passage, as a result of his open obedience to God, and his affront to the people, they plot against him. Again, this is the second time you see a plot. And this time, somebody read verses uh, 7 through 10. The priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. When Jeremiah finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, the priests and the prophets and all the people seized him, saying, You must die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house will be like Shiloh, and this city will be desolate without inhabitant? And all the people gathered about Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and sat in the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's house. Okay, why did they try to kill him? What did he do that got him so upset? 
been saying that for a long time. What was it? The temple. He spoke against the temple. So here's what I want you to see. He spoke against the temple. That's a precedent for Ezekiel who spoke against the temple in very, very clear ways. When we study Ezekiel, you'll see it. And who else spoke against the temple and got arrested? Jesus. Jesus was arrested, and one of the primary reasons he was, they laid hands on him was because he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rebuild it. And, you know, John goes on to say he spoke this of the temple of his body, but the important thing for you to understand is he spoke against the temple, and that was the thing that would get under the skin of Jewish leadership faster than anything else. He, he's been telling them the city's going to be destroyed. Nobody said anything about that. As soon as he gets up and says the temple's going to be destroyed, now they're arresting him and they're going to get rid of him, right? Or at least they're going to plot to do so. Go down to verse 16, because when it actually comes due for him to be uh, manhandled, it says, the officials and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, no death sentence for this man, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. So some supporters brought relief for Jeremiah so that he was not killed. It says that Micah of Moreshet prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. That's, the, that's Micah, the author of Micah. So put down next to it, you know, this is Micah the prophet. It's interesting because the Hebrew is quoted verbatim from Micah 3.12. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion will be plowed as a field and Jerusalem will become ruins and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. The point is that some of the elders in the land pointed back to the book of Micah that happened earlier. When is Micah contemporary to? It's not the time of Jeremiah. When, when was Micah? Micah was part of a triad. Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, Rough dates, yeah, it's say 720. That'll be Hezekiah, time of Hezekiah. This is much later, so here's the point. Even though this is the 500s and that was the 700s, why is Micah inserted in verse 18 here? Here's the thing. These officials said, don't kill him because we already have in the Hebrew Scriptures prophecies just like that. Why does that verse help me? Because it shows you that by the time of Jeremiah, Micah was already considered a prophet of old and he was being quoted as the Bible. That's going to be important. Does everybody get the point of that? That if Micah 3 is quoted as the word of God in Jeremiah, it means that 200 years after Micah, they've already published it, circulated it, believed it was the word of God. In other words, it's not like the time of Jesus that they decided what was the word of God in the Old Testament. They knew it all along. They had had pieces of it already. And we have, we have jewelry that has it on there. There's a guy who was buried in Ketef Inom in Jerusalem when they found the jewelry on him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. I mean, it was on jewelry. So you have all these critical scholars making it like, Ah, you know, the Bible came together very late. No, it didn't. Every indication is that it came together much earlier. Zion will be plowed as a field. Jerusalem will become as ruins. That's Micah 3.12. But it's also said here just to say what he's saying has been said before. Remember that when you're talking about Judaism, when you're talking about the Jewish people, a lot of their reasoning is based on what the fathers said. It's we're here because we stand on the shoulders of our fathers that went before us. He goes on, the rest of the chapter in chapter 26, it's all about this house is going to be like Shiloh, and, and he's protected because um, Achikam, the uh, son of Shaphan, and the other prophet Uriah prophesied. And, and, and what's interesting, Uriah, another prophet, Uriah prophesies against the city, and he flees to Egypt but he's brought back and he's slain. So if you go to the end of chapter 26, there's a story about a man by the name of Uriah. In verse 20, you can circle his name. And he prophesied against the city in verse 20, but he ran to Egypt. Verse 21, he fled and went to Egypt. But they brought him back, and it says in verse 23, Uriah, they brought Uriah from Egypt and, and led him to King Jehoiakim, who slew him with a sword and cast his body into the burial place of the common people. So it's not looking good for the prophets 
who were agreeing with Jeremiah. Jeremiah lived, but another guy did exactly what he did and ran and still died for it. So let's just say that they're becoming more and more and more pronounced with how negative they're being toward what God is saying. 27. Word, word comes to um, Jeremiah again during the reign of Jehoiakim or Jehoiakim. And the Lord told him to put bands and yokes on his neck and to send them to neighboring countries who want Judah to join in a war with Babylon. Now, here's the point. Verse 6 of chapter 27. I have given all these lands into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. What he's trying to say is submit to Babylon because I'm behind the king of Babylon. This is a strange thing for antiquity. You, do you remember we talked about this earlier, how when one, one kingdom fought another kingdom, the god of this kingdom was thought to have overthrown the god of that kingdom? This is weird. This is the Jewish reckoning that the god of the Hebrews is for the Babylonians against the Hebrews. Now that's weird, right? But, but that's what God says. Verse 14, I want you to mark off. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who speak to you saying, you will not serve the king of Babylon for they prophesy a lie. Put prophesy a lie to you. I have not sent them. God makes it very clear through Jeremiah, you are going down, Babylon is going to win and I'm behind it. It's not that the Babylonian god Marduk is going to take me to task and beat me. I'm behind them. That's a very strange thing. Now, as an example of the false prophets that are running around prophesying, you'll read in verse 28, or, or chapter 28, one of those prophets. This is a prophecy by Hananiah. It says, Now in the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month, Hananiah, the son of Azor, the prophet, who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I am going to bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. This, by the way, what you're reading right now is entirely fabricated. God said none of it. It is not true. He's making it up. Verse 3, uh, verse 4, I am going to bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim. Problem is that that had already been prophesied by Jeremiah as the opposite. He's not coming back. King of Judah and all the exiles of Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So Hananiah comes out with this bold prophecy. I'm going to wipe out the king of Babylon and everybody's coming back and the stuff they took from the temple. How many of you think Hananiah was an incredibly popular prophet when he prophesied that? Verse 5, Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. Now, fine, okay, we'll see. The prophet Jeremiah said, Amen! May the Lord do so. May the Lord confirm your, confirm your words which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all the exiles from Babylon to this place. Yet um, hear now this word which I'm about to speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people, the prophets who were before me and before you from ancient times prophesied against many lands and against great kingdoms of war and calamity and pestilence. The prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, then the prophet will be known as, as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet and he broke it. Now, here's what you see. He fabricated prophecy then Jeremiah did not dispute with him. He said, may it be as you've said from your mouth to God's ear. Great. I got this yoke on my back and you might have noticed it. God told me to put it there. Hananiah comes and breaks it, standing in direct opposition to what God told Jeremiah to do. So he's doubling back and making up his own word. And now he's breaking what God has told Jeremiah to do. 
Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people. Thus says the Lord, even so I will break within two years the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. You know what he just did? He took a symbol that God made and changed its meaning to his own prophecy. Now, I got to tell you, that's when God spoke up. Jeremiah really didn't care that he was saying the opposite thing. He wasn't all galled. He was hoping maybe it was true. But then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hanani the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah. Do you see the problem? You stepped in, you took my symbol that I instructed my guy to do, you broke it and you said something else with it. Go and speak to Hananiah. Say this. Thus says the Lord, you have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made instead of them yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Fine, fine, you broke my wood, I'm going to make it iron. You broke what was breakable, I'm going to make it unbreakable. He says in 16, thus says the Lord, behold, I am about to remove you from the face of the earth. This year you're going to die because you have counseled rebellion against the Lord. How did he counsel rebellion against the Lord? He broke the symbolism that God gave and decided to re... Listen, God has a special place in his heart that is galled by people who grab Bible verses and twist their meaning. This is something that he does not tolerate well. So all the people that are out there that are going to watch their... their um, daytime television talk show host that's going to quote the Bible and compassion to do things the Bible says don't do. God has a special design on this. Anania the prophet died in the same year, in the seventh month. So, obviously, it's, uh, he got out of the idea that he had to live long enough to see if the prophecy worked. He said it was going to happen in two years. He died in one. So when they all figured out he was wrong, he was already dead. And that's why he tells you that detail. Now, before you, I'm going to give you a break in just a minute, but I want you to, I want you to get to 29 because there's something there that you need to see. This is a, the game changer of the Old Testament. It's in verses 4 through 7. Put a box around it. It's huge. I mentioned this to you the other day when we were looking at the introduction. Up till now, in the Hebrew Scriptures, God had never told them how to live outside the land of Israel. They didn't know. Now they're being carted off, they're being taken away, and because they're being taken away into captivity, how are they supposed to live? Should they go and become a subversive movement of rebellion? Should they fight the Babylonians? Well, clearly that's not going to work. Should they begin holding prayer meetings for the downfall of the politician they hate? No, it says these are the words of the letter, that's, of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the elders of the exile. Underline that. Letters were going back and forth between Jerusalem and Babylon and Daniel was familiar with Jeremiah because they were being counseled by Jeremiah from Jerusalem. Chapter 29 is huge because it tells us that there's a connection between Jerusalem Jewry and Babylonian Jewry, but that's not all. Look what it says. It says um, in verse 3, the letter was sent by the hand of Elisah, the son of Shaphan, and Gamoria, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to, to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. This is what the letter said. The counsel of God concerning how to live in the pagan land that sets up Daniel 1.1 where they get dropped into pagan you. Okay? This is how you live. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Babylon. Number one, build houses and live in them. Number two, plant gardens and eat their produce. Number three, Take wives and become fathers of sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. He's not saying marry into the Babylonians. He's saying there's plenty of you there. You guys marry each other's children and do not decrease in number. 
In other words, I, I told Jeremiah not to build a family as the persecution came on and the deportation came on. Now you're deported. Get back to the fruitful and multiply thing. Get right back to it. How do you act in captivity? You keep on keeping on. And then he says, seek the welfare of the city that I have sent you into exile. That is shocking. It literally says, open your eyes to the reality that you are outside of the land and I want you to seek blessing for the Gentile city and the Gentile rulers. Pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will have welfare. This is huge because they had no clue that God was actually using Gentiles and they could pray for Gentiles. This is the basis of what goes on in synagogues around the world today as people pray for the government that's over them. By the way, we got everything in the function of the local church in the first century from the synagogue. So when Paul tells us to pray for those who have rule over us, there's, this is the beginning of a Romans 13. Okay, there's, this is the first time. It just hadn't happened before. You didn't have people in Jerusalem praying for the, you know, praying that the uh, local Edomites would somehow come to, to, to know the Lord God. They didn't see the mission that they had to attract people toward God. So God seeded them out into that place and then had them pray. Keep reading. Thus says the Lord of hosts, verse 8, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst or your diviners deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams which they dream, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. Again, mark next to it Daniel chapter 9 and see that this is part of what Daniel was looking for. This is obviously what he understood. 70 years and I will bring you back. He's sitting there going, hey man, it's been 68 and I don't see anybody packing. And I started praying. I fasted and prayed, Daniel says. Verse 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Some of you are just now for the first time registering these wonderful verses that have been talked over so many other people in other circumstances. Just remember, if you want the promises, you also want the problems, okay? God didn't say, blanket, I know the plans I have for all of you to do good and not calamity. He said they're in captivity. They're in calamity. I have a future for you. You know, we think of it, and, we, and it's all real positive to make all these personalized. But, you know, obviously, if you're a Jim Elliott and you're sitting there being surrounded by the Alka Indians, you can't start quoting, I know the plans I have for you and it's not going to be calamity. You're going to die that day. They're going to eat you, okay? So let's not plan on making everybody be able to take from these verses. Be careful. Be careful. We pilfer verses without context. Is it true to say God has a plan for you? Yes. Is it true that ultimately that plan will be good because it will tell his story? Yes. But don't turn it into, therefore I will get an A on the test, I will get the better job, and my skin will clear up. No. Okay? It doesn't work that way. And people pilfer the verses and hang it on their wall and act like they, they don't understand. The people who said that were sitting in captivity at the time. Okay? Then you will call upon me and you'll come and pray. What I love is verse 14. It says, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you. I will bring you back to the place where, you, where I've sent you into exile because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. And here's the thing. He steps back and he tells them, what a wonderful thing is going to happen. Submit to Babylon. Understand that you belong there. And what I really want you to do is understand there will be a speedy end to this captivity. 